Chapter 11, Preparing the Empire, Alfred Milner and the Round Table Alfred Milner remained consumed by his ambition to ensure that the British Empire would dominate the world. He was a man on a mission. A large number of senior conservatives, including Leo Amery, a fellow member of the inner core of the secret elite, urged him repeatedly to enter Parliament. They saw him as their natural leader, but nothing could move Milner's resolve to remain in the shadows. In stepping back from the front line, he avoided unwanting, unwanted attention and was able to pursue his all-consuming agenda without the responsibility that attends representation. Contrary to the widely held belief that he withdrew altogether from politics following his return from South Africa in 1905, Milner set himself the mammoth task of preparing the empire for war and bringing the most effective pressure to bear at once, if the necessity arose. He gave serious consideration to how the different countries within the Euro within the empire would react to war with Germany, how Dane's reform in Britain had prepared a small but highly trained British expeditionary force, but the empire remained a vast untapped source of fighting men, the cannon fodder to ensure victory. In the early years of the 20th century, Britain's empire covered a very large portion of the earth's surface with the with a population of some 434 million, including over 6 million men of military age. This could neither be ignored nor taken for granted. One of Milner's first, task, first tasks was to arrange a colonial conference in London in 1907. He, he, his stated agenda was to change the nature of the British Empire by creating an all-powerful imperial parliament that would reach across the world. At the same time, he had to ensure that the Dominions were willing to stand by Britain in the coming war. He urged participants to be a single power, speaking with one voice, acting and ranking as one great unity in the society of states. He pushed the heads of the Dominions to develop a twofold patriotism to their own homeland and to the wider, wider fatherland. If properly coordinated, the joint members of the empire would become one of the great political forces of the world. His vision embraced an empire of independent but loyal nations tied naturally to an imperial government constitutionally responsible to all the electors with power to act directly on individual citizens. He brought together the leading lights to devise a plan for future cooperation that would lead to greater still ambition. Quietly and unobtrusively, Alfred Milner sown the first seeds for a world government. More immediately, he and his secret elite conspirators knew that when war came, they had to be sure Australia, South Africa, and the other great dominions of the empire were ready and willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with Britain. Australia's premier, Alfred Deakin, was one of Milner's prime targets during and after the Colonial Conference. They shared a platform at the Queen's Hall on which Milner praised Australia's commitment to the empire and stressed the links of race and loyalty that bound the two nations. On his journey home, Deacon wrote a letter urging Milner to take up the leadership of the Imperial Party. As with many before him, he saw in Milner an inspirational character who could rally the younger men, attract the large section of British opinion which is waiting for a lead, and for an empire policy. Such was Deacon's belief in Milner that he wrote, I can see no other man who will be so much trusted. You can turn the tide. That was precisely the task that Milner set himself. He was no Canute, and he did not sit back and let events happen without asserting his conviction. One by one, he and his secret elite associates found ways to bind the, dom the Dominions 
ever more closely to Britain. At the conference, a plan was adopted to organize Dominion military, Dominion military forces in the same pattern as the British Army so that they could be integrated in an emergency. Milner's proposal led to a complete reorganization of the armies of New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa with highly beneficial results. Canada was the most challenging prospect. Its French-speaking Premier Wilfrid Laurier was a comparative outsider who was unmoved by appeals to Anglo-Saxon race unity. Milner made Canada his priority. At this time, Canada was recognized as the greatest dominion under the crown. British imperialists particularly treasured its wealth and future potential, but feared that it might abandon its imperial connection in favor of closer economic and political cooperation with the United States. The well-proven secret elite, secret elite tactic of manipulating colonial statemen held little sway with the Canadian Premier. In Laurier and Laurier's in Laurier's own words, the chief force they used to influence him was the pressure of a very select society. It is hard to stand up to the flattery of a gracious duchess. We were dined and wined by royalty and aristocracy and plutocracy, and always the talk of empire, empire, empire. Milner decided that a coast-to-coast -coast trip across Canada was necessary and prepared for the grueling journey by meeting as many Canadians in Britain as he could. Amongst them was a young man whom the secret elite recognized as a future leader for Canada, W.I. Mackenzie King, Mackenzie King. He met Milner at a compatriots club diner compatriots club dinner in April of nineteen oh eight, recording in his diary what was borne in upon me particularly in listening to Lord Milner was that it was the furtherance of the power and strength of the Brit British race that constituted the main purpose in their imperialist program. With the support of the Canadian Governor General, Earl Grey, a member of the secret elite's inner core, Milner toured Canada, crossing the country by rail to Vancouver. His message was one of praise for Canada's, for Canadian spirit and Canadian patriotism. He repeatedly stressed that Canada would be far greater as a member, perhaps in time the leading member, of that group of powerful through Pacific nations though Pacific nations then wait he repeatedly stressed that Canada would be far greater as a member perhaps in time the leading member of that group of powerful though Pacific nations than she could ever be in isolation his itinerary took him to Toronto and Montreal where he reiterated his belief that he was a citizen of the Empire whose final duty was to all the dominions of the crown. That is my country, was his bold pronouncement. The secret elite it ensured that his trip was favorably reported in the British press. Northcliffe's Daily Mail hailed him as the brain carrier of imperial policy and forecast his, high, his rise to high office after a conservative victory at the next election. The subtext of Milner's message was much more subtle. Power, duty, empire, loyalty. These were not chance remarks. His aim was to stir the empire and its sense of collective responsibility. We should all cooperate for some for common purposes on the basis of absolute unqualified equality of status. The common purpose lay ahead. On his return in June of 1909, Lord Milner threw his energies into an imperial press conference arranged and dominated by the secret elite. It was a grand affair that brought together over 60 newspaper owners, journalists, and writers from across the empire, both that governed India and the self-governing Canada, Australia, 
South Africa, and New Zealand. 600 of their counterparts from the British press and politicians both in and out of government mixed with military and naval staff at Shepherd's Bush exhi Exhibition Hall. Lloyd Roseberry welcomed delegates with warmth and dignity. The conference was, very tellingly, designed to rally the support of the empire for the mother country in time of war and foster imperial cooperation in both defense and communications. Roseberry's keynote address stressed that imperial defense was the most vital topic on the agenda. He warned that never before in the history of the world was there so threatening and overpowering a preparation for war. Though Germany was not mentioned by name, the clear inference was that the Kaiser was responsible for the preparations for war. No evidence was presented for the simple reason that none existed. None that is beyond the vivid imaginations of the fiction writers encouraged by Northcliffe and his stable of alarmists. The appeal was directed to the delegates' sense of duty, their loyalty, and of course their collective responsibility. Roseberry asked them to consider their heritage, their libraries, and their race, the source of their language, and the institutions that made every single delegate present an essential part of the empire. He called on them to take back to their young dominions across the seas the measure, the message that the personal duty for national defense rests on every man and citizen of the, of the empire. Asquith, Haldane, Churchill, and Milner all addressed the delegates. Lord Roberts trumpeted his crusade for conscription from the platform. Milner argued that big armies were a means of preserving peace. No expense was spared to accommodate and influence the journalists. The Australian delegates from the, Arg the Argus of Melbourne wrote handsomely in admiration of Haldane and the British Army. He witnessed the presentation of colors to the new territorial regiment at Windsor and assured his readers that Germany would never dare invade Great Britain. Armaments factories were visited in Manchester. Fairfield's shipyards in Glasgow hosted the delegates and proudly displayed the destroyers being built for Australia. Honorary degrees were conferred on several leading newspaper men from Canada, Australia, India, and South Africa. Every effort was made to impress, indeed, over all the visitors, over all the visitors. The piece de resistance, the grand propaganda coup that could never be trumped, was their visit to the Naval Review at Spithead, organized by Jackie Fisher himself. Geoffrey Dawson, representing then the fortnightly review, recorded his unqualified admiration. Moved by the overwhelming impact of an 18 miles of battle-ready warship, warships, he wrote that it was a wonderful sight and made me realize what British sea power is. One of the journalists present noted that the fleet included seven dreadnoughts, so far the only ones afloat. Consider this last statement, so far the only ones afloat. How can that square with Roseberry's assertion that others were engaged in threatening preparation for war? The message the delegates were given was the same as that being delivered by the Northcliffe Press. Britain and the Empire had to be prepared. The final session of the Imperial Press Conference on the 26th of June was chaired by King Edward's personal advisor, Lord Escher, who examined the roles of the colonies in Imperial defense. Delegates were wined and dined at the Wardorf Waldorf before returning to inspire their readers across the empire. The Imperial Press Conference was a major public relations triumph. Northcliffe, 
responded to congratulations on its success by claiming that it was one of the most important gatherings that has ever taken place in England. Replete with secret elite members and associates, what was the intended impact of this conference? They met Haldane, saw his new territorial army, Milner, Escher, Roberts, Roseberry, naval shipbuilders, Australian destroyers, the Spithead Review, with the reiterated message that big armies preserve peace. Crucially, these delegates were in position to encourage the young men of the colonies and dominions to sign their life away in 1914. The success of these preparations should be judged by the level of willing volunteers from the empire when war was declared. Another important message learned from the conference was that bad news undermined efforts to promote the ideal of an empire gathered around a strong motherland that had to be defended at all costs. Delegates were deliberately shielded from reality during their carefully staged visit. The secret elite, and Milner in particular, were convinced that some concrete action had to be taken in order to stop the negative the negative news stories and strikes, moral decay, social unrest, parliamentary discord, and the general decline in standards that rolled off the British press and undermined confidence overseas. For those few weeks in June, a temporary truce had been called over dreadnoughts and budgets because the secret elite fully understood that the old image of Merry England, the land of hope and glory, had to be sustained. Geoffrey Dawson advocated an imperial press service that pooled the news and was specifically designed to positively influence public opinion in every part of the empire. While it was vital that the empire was wholly organized for war, it was equally important that steps be taken to draw the dominions and colonies towards the secret elite vision of an all-powerful imperial parliament. The enthusiasm with which the press delegates departed for home was marked was matched by the, the eagerness of a special breed of imperial zealots whom Milner had schooled in South Africa. The young men from his kindergarten returned to Britain fired with zeal. Guided by their mentor, they conspired to revolutionize, to revolutionize the empire by setting up small influential groups to promote the grand plan of imperial unification. They dubbed themselves the Round Table, a grand Arthurian, Arthurian, a grand Arthurian type a grand authorian title which suggested equality of rank and importance, nobility of purpose, and fairness in debate. In fact, it was an unholy association of Rhodes' secret society. Milner was the authority to whom all gave recognition and service. His men from South Africa, mixed with new adherents, including Sir Alfred Zimmern, Sir Reginald Coupland, and the American millionaires Waldorf and Nancy Astor, each of whom is named by Carol Quigley as a member of the secret elite. Most members of the round table were lifelong friends. It was an intimate fellowship that held a high opinion of itself. They looked on one another with admiration and resolved to do great things together in the national interest. Alfred Milner acted as both elder statesman and father figure, and his role in the round table was described as that of president of, of president of an intellectual republic. Their objective was to win power and authority in national and imperial affairs. Round table groups were essentially propaganda vehicles, comprising a handful of influential people that Quigley believed were created to ensure that the Dominions would join the United Kingdom in a future war with Germany. Closer ties with the United States were also considered of crucial importance, and a roundtable group was established in New York to encourage links between Westminster and Washington, and high finance in the City of London and Wall Street. It was managed in secret, hidden from the electorate, 
and the politicians and went unreported in the press. Roundtable members aimed to gain political influence and set the political agenda, but they were not willing to stand up in public. All was to be carried out in secret. How dangerous are those who believe that they have the capacity to think and plan for the nation's good, impervious to the will of the people and disdainful of democracy itself? Funded originally by the South African gold bug, Sir Al Sir Abe Bailey Roundtable Groups. Funded originally by the South African gold bug, Sir Abe Bailey, Roundtable Groups were established in London, South Africa, Can Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. They were also supported financially by Rhodes Trust and wealthy secret elite members such as Be It Brothers in South Africa. Other contributors included the Astor family and wealthy individuals, trusts or firms associated with the international banking, banking fraternity, including J.P. Morgan and the Rockefeller dynasty. Roundtable members held private meetings on or moots and worked out solutions to the national problems that fitted their philosophy. Their plan involved the formation of powerful semi-secret groups in the major countries of the empire to influence colonial government and newspaper proprietors. It was a logical extension of the aims of imperial press conference. It advanced the fundamental idea of imperial unity. Once they had a blueprint and a body of supporters in all parts of the empire, the quiet conspiracy could give way to a great crusade. Their techniques had been refined over the previous century and Milner above all knew how to manipulate newspapers and influence editorials. These individuals considered themselves the intellectual st standard bearers for secret elite policies. They promoted their aims anonymously in their periodical. The Roundtable, a quarterly review of the politics of the British Empire. The first article in the first issue of November 1910, the first article in the first issue of November 1910, Anglo-German rivalry, was deliberately pro provocative. It set the tone for all the anti-German rhetoric that was to come. Carol Quigley confirmed that this was the overriding purpose of the roundtable. There can be no doubt that the original inspiration for the Roundtable movement was to be found in anti-German feeling. In fact, there are some indications that this was the primary motive and that the stated purpose of working in, for Imperial Federation was, to some extent, at least a mask. Unfortunately, he took that analysis no further. Nor can we find evidence, for secrecy surrounds almost everything that the round table organized. Indeed, as he put it, the whole group was so secretive that even today, many close students of the subject are not aware of its significance. The round table editor was Milner's protege, Philip Kerr, but no name appeared in the magazine, neither editor nor contributors. Anonymity extended to an unnamed secretary at 175 Piccadilly, to whom letters could be sent. The promoters claimed that they did not expect a large circulation, but sought to, sought to directly influence a select public opinion. Why they printed the journal without naming contributors was never explained, though at that time, though at that level of conceit, they probably didn't feel the need to justify themselves. Practical politicians treated the Roundtable Quarterly Review with deserved suspicion because it sought to influence power without responsibility. Nevertheless, the publication became an important forum for secret elite propaganda, and many of the ideas in later editions were translated into British foreign policy. Between 1910 and 1914, the Roundtable exerted a tremendous influence on political thinking in every part of the empire, 
essentially it was an anti-German propaganda vehicle and an advocate of imperial unity. Milner sent his most trusted acolytes to organize roundtable groups throughout the empire. Between 1910 and 1912, Lionel Curtis Curtis traveled the world organizing in India and Canada. Milner himself, accompanied by Philip Kerr, went back to Canada to inspire roundtable associates. Their message reinforced through articles in the Roundtable Quarterly Review and bolstered by their friends in the press, so carefully nurtured during the Imperial Press Conference, repeated the mantra of loyalty, duty, unity, and the benefits of empire, empire, empire. The members of roundtable groups across the world held influential positions in government, trade, commerce, and banking. There was a question... There was a quasi-Masonic Jesuit approach that allowed them to prepare the dominions for the coming war, hidden from public view. It proved a resounding success. The empire would be ready. In the final analysis, Canada sent 461,000 men. By 1917, it was delivering more than a quarter of the artillery munitions used by used by Britain on the Western Front. Over 250,000 Canadians worked in the armament factories under the British Imperial Munition Board. South Africa provided 136,000 fighting troops, as well as enlisting 75,000 non-Australians. 75 thousand non-whites. Australia placed its navy under British command and a total of 332,000 Australians went to war for Europe, went to war for the empire. New Zealand provided 112,000 men while India alone raised 1,477,000 including 138,000 men stationed on the western front in 1915. In general, the governments that sent colonial troops paid for them. Summary, Chapter 11, Preparing the Empire, Alfred Milner and the Round Table. Contrary to the belief that Alfred Milner retired from politics in 1905, he was heavily involved behind the scenes promoting imperial unity and promote and preparing the empire for war. He was instrumental in setting up a colonial conference in 1907, at which it became clear that considerable work was required to safeguard Canada's position within the empire. The Imperial Press Conference in 1909, which was organized and dominated by the secret elite, proved an outstanding success. Its major theme concerned the duty of loyalty. It it concerned the duty and loyalty each dominion and colony owned to the fatherland. An imperial press service was specifically designed to disseminate good news stories about Britain and influence public opinion throughout the throughout the empire. At the same time, a secretive organization, the Round Table, was created in London by Milner and his followers to influence government about imperial unity and the defense of the empire. These imperial think tank groups were established across the British Empire and were funded by secret elite members and sympathizers. Their policies were published anonymously in the Round Table magazine, and the entire organization, which was hidden from public view, was highly antagonistic to Germany and would prove its worth in the next years ahead.